Hello and welcome to Rob's Retro Reviews. Did you know that I recently passed my driving test and I can officially control cars on the open road? So, to celebrate, why don't we take a look at a video game that I absolutely love. It's not only my favourite racing game ever made, not only my favourite kart racer, not only my favourite Crash Bandicoot game, but it's also one of my favourite games ever made, period. That's right, today we're taking a look at Crash Team Racing for the PS1. Crash Team Racing was developed by Naughty Dog and published by Universal Interactive Studios and Sony Computer Entertainment in the year 1999. This makes it the last Crash Bandicoot game that was ever made by the original creators of the series before they moved on to the Jack and Daxter PS2 games. The game is basically a copy of the Mario Kart series, letting you play as a ton of characters from the Crash universe who take part in go-kart races and can use a variety of weapons to slow down the competition. Throughout this review I'm probably going to be comparing Crash Team Racing to Mario Kart quite a lot, and the reason for that is because Mario Kart was, and still is, the most popular kart racer around. Having said that, Crash Team Racing probably has more in common with Diddy Kong Racing, but the thing there is, I've never played it, so I can't really comment on that. Maybe I should get around to giving it a go one day. So jumping straight into the game, the first thing I like about Crash Team Racing is the fact it has an actual story, and while it's nothing deserving of any awards for its narrative, it's still a nice touch that there's a story at all. Basically, Crash and his friends and enemies just so happen to be having a go-karting competition when an evil alien named Nitrous Oxide appears and watches them from aboard his spaceship. He challenges Crash and the gang to take part in a racing competition, and the overall winner will then race Oxide himself to determine the fate of the world. If Crash and the gang wins, Oxide will leave and never return to Earth, but if Oxide wins, he'll enslave the planet. Pretty high stakes for a go-karting competition. One thing that always used to bother me is this game's placement in the Crash timeline. We know that it's not set after Crash 3 due to Cortex and Entropy not being in the baby forms, and we know it's set after Crash 2 because Uka Uka has been freed from his prison. So I guess this is set between Crash 2 and 3? So after Ruka Ruka is freed, they all just take a break to enter a go-kart tournament and forget about saving and trying to take over the world. Either that or I'm reading way too much into the chronology of Crash Bandicoot. I think I'll go with my previous theory though. So the whole game from the first cutscene is basically just the story of your chosen character becoming the champion racer of Earth and then proceeding to face Oxide in the final battle. A ridiculously simple story, but one which I appreciate existing. I mean, Mario Kart has never even had a storyline at all, so that's 1-0 to Crash Team Racing already. Getting into the game itself, we have four primary modes to choose from on the main menu. Adventure mode is where the meat of the game is, and this is where you'll progress the story and eventually have the opportunity to race Oxide. Time trial mode is basically the equivalent of the time trial mode in Mario Kart, giving you an empty track with no CPU races or power-ups, and seeing how quickly you can make it through each track. Arcade mode is this game's equivalent of Mario Kart's Grand Prix mode, where you pick a cup, which is four tracks long, and race against other people, or CPUs, and gain more points, the better in the race you do. The overall victor being the person with the most points at the end of the cup. And finally we have Battle Mode, which, as to be expected, is the game's equivalent of Mario Kart's Battle Mode, where you drive around an openly designed stage and have to get as many hits as you can on your opponents with a variety of power-ups, while avoiding getting hit yourself. I figure the best way of going about reviewing this game is to go through each of its modes one at a time and break the game down a bit. So, seeing as Adventure Mode is the main portion of the game, let's start there. Start an Adventure Mode will enable you to pick one of eight characters who all have unique stats which can be seen on the side of the character select screen. Basically, Polar and Pura are best at turning, Dingo Dial and Tiny are the best at speed, Coco and Engine are the best at accelerating, and Crash and Cortex are the standard all-rounder characters. For this review, I figured I would go with Crash, seeing as he is the main character of the game after all. After picking your character, you're thrown into a hub area where you can access portals to send you into proper races. This is one of the main things I love about this game. While I don't spend a long time at all in these hub areas, and I actually think they could have included hidden collectibles here to give them a little bit more substance, I think these areas are amazing for getting you used to the basic controls, giving you a sense of atmosphere which ties the racing together a little bit better, and also makes this game feel like a fully fleshed out Crash Bandicoot game, rather than just a spin-off that can be tossed aside. Looking at the portals to the levels will also tell you what you have left to do in each track, and a handy little map will stop you from ever getting lost by displaying your position and where the different portals are. 
It always feels rewarding entering a new area of the hub world, and because of the drastically different theming in each section, it never begins to look boring or repetitive either. Bear in mind here that Mario Kart literally doesn't have a story mode at all, so the fact Crash Team Racing not only has one, but it has this much depth is pretty impressive. I feel like I'm already gushing about how good this game is, and I've not even started talking about the actual racing yet, so let's get on with it. Upon first entering a portal in the hub world, you'll be taken to a race where you'll be competing against seven other CPUs in a three-lap race around your chosen stage. Just like in Mario Kart, you can break boxes and get an item which is tied to what position you're in. So if you're in last place, you'll be getting more offensive weaponry, whereas if you're in first place, you'll either get defensive power-ups or projectile weapons which can be placed to make traps for the people behind you. I find that the weapon balance in here is much better than in the Mario Kart series, and there are multiple reasons for this. But before I get into that too much, let's first talk about another important aspect of Crash Team Racing that directly ties to this. You know how in Mario Kart you can drift, and by drifting for a while you can achieve a boost which activates when you let go of the drift button? Crash Team Racing has a very similar booster mechanic, but instead of simply holding the drift button down to get the boost, you have to press L1 while drifting as the smoke on your cart changes to black to activate a mini boost. You can chain together these small boosts three times, and then the third boost you get will be a much more powerful one, which will give you a big advantage over the other people racing against you. This small change to the drifting mechanic is an absolutely amazing one in my opinion, because not only does it feel more skill based because you have to drift at the right time and in the right position, but you also then have to time your button presses to actually take advantage of the boosts fully. It also gives you a greater degree of control over your movement because you can choose to only activate the first or second level of boost to go slightly faster without boosting too quickly off of the track or over drifting into a wall. To put it simply, the controls in Crash Team Racing are pretty much perfect, and it's not only the drifting mechanic that makes it this way. This seems like a stupid thing to say nowadays because every kart racer pretty much does this, but if you jump at the end of a ramp you'll get more hang time in the air, and upon hitting the ground you'll gain a boost. This is such a simple thing, but its effectiveness and how natural it feels is amazing. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this was the first ever kart racer to actually do this, at least to this extent. What this basically means is that if you get good at drifting and jumping, you can pretty much do entire levels without ever stopping boosting. Whenever you aren't going up a ramp and getting a boost from that, you can be drifting. And this makes the game feel amazing, and also gives you a huge amount of satisfaction from mastering the controls because of the difference it makes when you've done so. Now, let's go back to what I was saying about the weapons and how they're more balanced than Mario Karts. What I mean by this is that Crash Team Racing is far more about how good you are at the game as opposed to how lucky you get with weapons. The amount of times I've been beaten in Mario Kart simply because of an enemy getting a particular item is ridiculous, and in Crash Team Racing that was never a situation that occurred to me in all of my time playing it for this review. The reasons for this are that it's much easier to recover after taking a hit because the boosting mechanics can be activated much quicker, and that the weapons are much, much more fair too. For example, if somebody throws a red shell in Mario Kart, that thing seems to track you down to the ends of the earth, and it's difficult to ever avoid getting hit if you don't have a weapon yourself. The equivalent to red shells in Crash Team Racing are these rockets, which lock onto enemies and track them down. However, they will only track your enemy if you can actually see them yourself, and even then, they'll be stopped by tight corners and if your opponent manages to somehow take cover. On top of this, the weapon guarding from Mario Kart will also work against the rockets in Crash Team Racing too. So you can place the TNT crate behind you, which the rocket will impact with rather than hitting you. So you have a lot more options to avoid incoming weapons. Even the equivalent of the blue shell can be guarded against by using a shield item, which you can get reasonably often in first place. And I know Mario Kart 8 added in the Super Horn which can do the same thing, but come on, you never get that thing in first place, so the whole gimmick of that is pretty much non-existent. I'm not going to break down every single weapon here, but almost every basic Mario Kart weapon has an alternative, and they're all fun to use, and don't seem too much like a carbon copy of the Mario Kart items, due to their Crash Bandicoot coat of paint and subtle differences in the way that they function. You know what does get slightly annoying, is that early on in the game, Aku Aku appears really frequently to teach the player the basics of the game, which is handy if you're a new player, but a little bit irritating if you're already experienced with it. 
To access this track, you must first collect the number of trophies required Ugh. to turn on the warp pad. This is the load. Oh, space. come on. There You must have a boss. Jeez, to just go away. To access this boss garage. Oh my god, leave me alone. Place. What the You must have two boss keys to open this door. You can race a boss after being Get the hell out of here. Yeah. That's right. Another overlooked mechanic of Crash Team Racing, and something which in my opinion makes it a lot more interesting to play than Mario Kart, is the Wumpa Fruit collectibles. Upon getting 10 Wumpa Fruit, your kart will get a speed boost, which on its own really isn't anything special, and that's something Super Mario Kart did way before this game was even thought about. But the secondary thing getting 10 Wumpa Fruit does is upgrade all the weapons you get. So those bottles you can throw out which stun enemies, they now don't only do that, but they make a rain cloud appear above opponents' heads, which makes the carts temporarily chug and lose speed. The TNT boxes? They turn into nitro crates, which can't be shook off and will explode directly upon impact. Each weapon gets a substantial upgrade, but it's stopped from being too overpowered by the fact that you lose Wumpa Fruit if you get hit or fall off of the track. All of these things combined lays the foundation for an amazing kart racer, but one thing we still need to talk about are the tracks featured in the game. The tracks in Crash Team Racing are mostly very well designed and interesting. There's a couple of stinkers in there like Coco Park for example, which is a boring flat circle that takes far too long to complete a lap on, but the vast majority of tracks are amazing and unique. Most tracks feature an original theme, like a gothic castle, a pirate island, a sewer system, a lava filled cave, and the list goes on. The only theme that's ever reused in fact is a snow theme, and even then it only appears twice, and they're different enough from each other to warrant coexisting. But let's throw away the visual design, and even then the tracks are varied, often having a unique gimmick to keep things feeling fresh. Tiger Temple, for example, features lots of ramps and bumps in the track, while also having interior sections with fire blasting out from the statues which can catch unsuspecting racers. And it features the only shortcut in the game you have to access by using a weapon. Then there's Engine Labs, which has a high speed tunnel section which forces you to boost all the way through it, and an obstacle which rolls directly towards the player, something which doesn't appear on any other track. And there's so many more interesting twists in most tracks that really make each one of them memorable. After getting all of the trophies in one particular area in adventure mode, you then have to beat a boss in a race on the home turf. These bosses will all have access to an infinite supply of a particular weapon, and they'll be much better races than the standard characters you've faced previously. Beating these bosses gives you a boss key, which will unlock the door to the next area and shortcuts to previous areas too. After getting a boss key though, you can also replay the races you already got the trophy on and take part in a CTR challenge or a relic race. The CTR challenges have you take part in a standard race, just like you did to get a trophy, but this time you have to not only come first, but find a hidden C, T and R letter floating somewhere in the stage. These are fun and have you play levels slightly differently, because rather than just blasting through, you're taking your time to look at the environment and really pay attention to each area. The Relic Racers have you take part in a race against the clock without any CPU interference. There'll be time boxes placed around the track that will freeze the clock for a particular amount of time. Breaking every single one of these time boxes will shave 10 full seconds off of your time too, which makes it easier to get the Platinum Relics. These Relic Racers and CTR challenges combined force you to learn every inch of every track, and by the end of finishing the game, you'll know exactly where every shortcut is without the game explicitly telling you outright. When you drive into a boss garage to start a boss race, there's actually an invisible wall at the end of the garage that you can crash into. I used to like to imagine that the boss was sat there shrouded in darkness just waiting for you to crash into them, but in reality, it's obvious the developers just put a wall there to stop you driving off of the map or something. But still, it can be fun just imagining Papu Papu sat in darkness, waiting for his next victim. 
The real challenge of the game as a whole comes from getting all of the platinum relics. The trek Papu's Pyramid literally took me over an hour to get the platinum, and while this was by far the hardest level, I did somewhat struggle with some of the others too. But it never became frustrating, so there's a pretty good balance of difficulty here. As well as the standard races, boss races, CTR challenges and relic races, we also have these special bonus stages which unlock after each boss is defeated. In these, you'll need to find a number of crystals within a short amount of time while moving around an open stage. These are great for giving the game a slight boost of variety because they feel quite substantially different to the other game styles in Adventure Mode. After finally getting every single trophy in Adventure Mode, you can face Oxide in the final boss fight, and is definitely the hardest boss in the game, being extremely quick and also having access to every type of weapon from all of the previous bosses you've battled. But after defeating him, we're shown Oxide throwing a tantrum in his spaceship and saying you can't say you're the fastest until you've gotten all of the relics. Upon getting these relics, you can face Oxide one final time and unlock the true ending where Oxide finally leaves Earth's orbit after admitting you're faster than him. A bit of an anticlimactic ending, but what did you expect? Getting all of the CTR tokens, awarded for completing the CTR challenges and the bonus levels, will unlock special gem cups where you'll race across four tracks in a row against harder CPU characters, and by winning each of the five gems from these gem cups, you'll unlock new characters to play as in the other modes of the game. I tell you what, I can't wait to unlock Oxide as a playable character. It's going to be awesome playing as him. Oh. So the first four cups give us Ripperoo, Papu Papu, Komodo, Joe and Pinstripe, and the final gem unlocks Fake Crash? Okay, a bit of an odd choice of character to include in this game, I did want to play as Oxide. I guess you unlock him in another mode? Either way, after getting every trophy, CTR token, relic and gem, you've fully completed the game, and if you get all of the platinum relics, you'll achieve 101% completion. Which is a nice nod to the fact that you could get 105% completion in Crash 3. So, with that, we've finally finished the main mode of the game, and I have to say, the amount of substance here is absolutely incredible. With a game like Mario Kart, I find myself getting quite bored fairly quickly, especially when playing the single player. But Crash Team Racing isn't just about straight up racing, and actually transfers some of the mechanics of the core Crash games, which makes it feel less like a spin-off, and more like it's a part of the main series. I particularly like how well the time trial mode from Crash 3 translates to Crash Team Racing, and how the collectathon elements are also brought into Crash Team Racing too, with the CTR challenges, Wumper Fruit collecting, crystal bonus levels, and having to break all of the time boxes in the relic mode. It's really shocking to me that Crash Team Racing had this adventure mode so long ago, and yet the king of kart racers, Mario Kart, has literally never had an equivalent of it. The amount of content featured in Crash Team Racing absolutely blows any Mario Kart out of the water. In fact, let's compare some statistics between Crash Team Racing and Mario Kart 64, Mario Kart 64 being the closest game in the series to the release of Crash Team Racing. So Mario Kart 64 has 16 tracks, pretty impressive, but Crash Team Racing has 18 of them, meaning that there's slightly more content to be found in Crash's game, and that's without considering the different hub worlds as tracks. Mario Kart 64 has 8 characters, which is actually quite pathetic looking back on it, and while Crash Team Racing only has 8 to start with, upon unlocking them all, there's actually 15 characters, including almost every single character from the previous 3 Crash games. Mario Kart 64 has 4 battle maps, which again is pretty good and offers quite a bit of variety, but Crash Team Racing yet again comes out on top by having 7 battle maps. Hell, 7 battle maps is almost just as many as Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, which has 8 of them, but bear in mind that that was released 18 years after Crash Team Racing. Now, this isn't me saying that I don't like Mario Kart, but you've got to admit, Crash Team Racing is extremely impressive. It literally beats Mario Kart 64 in every area, and this was the first kart racer that Naughty Dog had ever made. On top of that, it's also said that the development of Crash Team Racing only lasted 8 months, which is absolute insanity. See what I did there? Anyway, let's stop spouting these statistics and get back to playing the actual game, shall we? So you've finished Adventure Mode and you think this journey is over, eh? 
Well, we still have several other modes to talk about, so let's go through them now. First up is the time trial mode, where you race to complete three laps of all of the tracks in the game, and see how quickly you can do it without the aid of time boxes or power-ups or interference from enemy racers. It seems like quite an unnecessary mode at first, but then you discover that upon getting a decent time, you unlock a race against Entropy. His time is reflected by his ghost, which appears racing alongside you when you retry the tracks. If you beat every single one of his times, I bet you unlock Oxide as a playable character. I can't wait to try him out. Beating Entropy's times is no easy task, but it's by no means the hardest thing to do in the game either. I actually think getting the Platinum Relics is a lot harder, but that's obviously just relative to how you play the game. And after finally beating him on every track, which by the way takes a very long time to do, you unlock a new character, who just so happens to be... Entropy. As much as I do like Entropy, I really wanted to play as Oxide, to be honest. But there's that little gap between the bottom two characters on the character select screen, so you obviously unlock him at some point. By replaying the time trials after beating Entropy's times, you can attempt an even greater challenge, which is to beat Oxide's times. However, this is by far the hardest thing to do in the entire game, and it requires absolute mastery of the tracks, and I'm not ashamed to say, I didn't beat these for this review. It would have taken too long, and this has already been the game that I've played for the longest amount of time for a review. So yeah, sorry about that. Luckily, with the power of the internet, I know what beating Oxide's times unlocks anyway, and it's just a scrapbook viewer. So although it's good you get a reward, it is a pretty measly one. The next thing to do is Arcade Mode, and how weird is it that this is actually the main mode in the Mario Kart series, and yet we're only talking about it now as a side note in Crash Team Racing. There isn't too much to say about this mode. It's just four races in a row you complete, and by winning all four of the cups, you'll unlock a new battle mode stage and a harder difficulty in Arcade Mode itself. By then finishing the four cups again on the harder difficulty, you'll unlock yet another battle mode stage, and also another harder difficulty. And then completing it yet, yet again, you'll unlock another battle mode stage, and... that's it. No new characters to be found here. Well, I guess you unlock Oxide by doing something in battle mode then? Spoiler warning, you can't actually play as Oxide in Crash Team Racing. He was planned to be playable, and he can actually be accessed by using a GameShark code, but with the short amount of development time Naughty Dog had, he had to be cut from the final game. So the question now is, what's with that gap on the character select screen? Well, this gap is actually for a character called Penta Penguin, who is briefly seen in Crash 3 being bullied by Dingo Dial at the start of his boss fight. The thing is though is that you can't unlock Penta in the game itself, and you actually have to use a cheat code to get him. But the thing is, I've basically got 100% completion on this game, and to use a cheat code at this point just feels wrong. I could have just have cheated to get every character in that case, and I'm not the sort of person who would do that. I like to unlock things legit. So you know what? I'm just not going to unlock Penta Penguin at all. Screw you, game. I do actually have a very vivid memory of unlocking Penta Penguin legitimately, by accessing the North Bowl Battle Arena and crashing into an igloo at high speed. But no such thing happens, so I guess I either imagined it, or dreamt it. Now for this whole review, I've not mentioned anything negative about Crash Team Racing, and that's because for the most part, there genuinely isn't anything wrong with it. However, there are a couple of things that irritate me slightly, and dampen the experience a bit. So, let's talk about the things I don't like about this game. The first thing is how there's literally no reason to play the battle mode because it doesn't unlock anything. Plus, the battle mode doesn't feature a CPU mode, so it's multiplayer only. Which, while it is much more fun playing it with actual people, it means that you can't play it at all if you don't have friends who are willing to try it out with you. My proposition as to how this should have been handled is by completing the hardest difficulty of arcade mode, you shouldn't have unlocked an extra battle mode arena, and instead should have unlocked a new character. Then battle mode itself should have had a CPU mode which had battle cups which consisted of three battle matches in a row. One of these cups should have been unlocked from the start, and the other unlocks after earning the extra battle arenas from arcade mode. Then by completing the second battle mode cup, you unlock the seventh battle mode arena, which could be a battle against Oxide, and upon doing that you unlock another character. This then would give battle mode a much needed CPU mode, and also give players a reason to actually play the mode to unlock things. 
Arcade mode would have also felt more rewarding because of unlocking an extra character too. Another thing I would change is make beating Oxide's times in time trial mode unlock a new character as well. Potentially this is how Oxide himself should have been unlocked. Also, Penta Penguin should have been legitimately unlockable, it's ridiculous that he isn't. Speaking of all of these unlockable characters, while most of the main characters from the Crash trilogy are here, there's a couple that are strangely absent, and I would have loved to have seen them included. There's Enbryo, Koala Kong, Torna Bandicoot and Komodo Mo that are missing, and I think this is very odd. Enbryo in particular was literally one of the main characters of Crash 1 and 2, and I don't like how he was basically forgotten about after the second game. He could have been such an interesting character to learn more about after his betrayal of Cortex in Crash 2. Perhaps the biggest negative about the whole game though is that if you play it within a short amount of time like I did for this review and if you go in for full 100% completion, you have to play through every track in the game an absolutely insane amount. So let's go through it. You need to play adventure mode and get the trophies, the CTR tokens, the relics and then the gems so that's already four times you've had to do every track. Then there's the time trial mode where you need to do them once to unlock Entropy's times and then actually beat them, so that's another two playthroughs of all of the tracks. Then you do arcade mode three times across three difficulties, so that's another three playthroughs. So in total, to complete the game you need to do every track nine times. That's without beating Oxide's times and also assuming you do every single challenge on your first attempt too, which isn't going to happen. While I love this game, it asks a lot from you to play through the same tracks this many times, and while they do mix it up with the different modes, it doesn't change the fact that you're basically doing the same thing in the same environments over and over. This isn't a problem at all if you're only doing one particular mode of the game and then taking a break for ages and then maybe coming back to do another mode a lot later, but if you do everything the game has to offer like I did, my god it can be draining. The music is also a little bit mediocre, which is odd considering the same composer from the Crash trilogy worked on this, but to be fair, this may have been done on purpose to highlight the sound effects over the music because the sound effects are actually helpful in terms of gameplay. They help with things like knowing what enemies have what weapons, timing boosts, and also knowing how close enemies are. It's also a bit disappointing how the battle mode only has one music track rather than having unique music for each stage. The sound effects are amazing though and I really can't fault them. The noise that boosting makes feels satisfying and the slamming sound as you fly up a ramp and crash onto the floor gives your character a sense of weight and the unique sounds for each weapon gives them more personality. All the characters have voice samples too, which really puts across their already established characteristics well and doesn't become annoying because they only happen sparingly. There is a small issue with certain levels being a little bit boring, but this is literally only a problem with one or two of them and because the standard is so high with all of the others, it's an issue that's easily ignored. An issue that I've always found quite odd is that there's actually no way of seeing the unlockable characters stats within the game itself, and instead the only way of finding out what they are is to look them up online, which isn't ideal. You also can't use unlockable characters in adventure mode, but to be honest this isn't too much of a problem because to unlock the majority of them you need to have completed this mode anyway. Also the unlockable characters mostly consist of the bosses you race against in the game anyway, and it would be weird to see Ripperoo racing against Ripperoo in a boss fight for example. We've finally gone through pretty much everything the game's got to offer, but there's one thing I'm still yet to talk about and it's a fairly substantial part of the game. Multiplayer. Arcade mode and battle mode can be played in local multiplayer with up to four people, either by using a PS1 multi-tap or simply with four controllers if you're playing on a PS3, and this works pretty damn well. In order to keep the performance of the game high, graphics will actually be slightly less detailed when playing in multiplayer, but this is a trade-off that had to be made with it running on a PS1. There's also a versus mode which lets you pick a single track to race on and doesn't include any CPU opponents, so it's just you and your friends against each other. The multiplayer options offered here are pretty good and I imagine a lot of people would have only played these modes and didn't even touch the adventure mode or time trial mode because of how fun the multiplayer is on its own. What it really comes down to is that the base game is so good that you can literally just do the straight up racing and have a good time. But then the added flair with the adventure mode, battle mode and time trial mode makes the game feel like something a lot more special than just a Mario Kart clone or a forgettable Crash Bandicoot spin-off. One of the last things I've got to talk about is the potential of a remake of Crash Team Racing on PS4. 
But rather than take up too much of your time, I'll make an entirely separate video about that, which will be uploaded shortly after this review. So you can look forward to that in the near future. Crash Team Racing is my favourite racing game of all time, and because of that it's obvious I'm going to give it a high score. But let's face it, it's not a perfect game and it does have some flaws. But in the grand scheme of things, these flaws are so small that it really doesn't impact the game as a whole. So, I'm giving Crash Team Racing a 9 out of 10. Where the game shines is in its incredibly tight controls and how well the mechanics of the Crash Trilogy are meshed into the kart racing genre. It keeps you wanting to go through and complete each mode simply to see what happens next, and it feels like each and everything you do unlocks something new. And while this does disappoint sometimes, most of the time the stuff you unlock is worth it, and then it makes you want to play the game even more with all of the unlocked content. The graphics are really damn good for a PS1 game, and while they're obviously dated a bit by today's standards, I don't think this at all detracts from how great the game is. The sound design is really good and the music is a bit forgettable but gets its job done, and the fact this game even has a story is a plus considering most kart racers simply don't bother with this. If by any chance you haven't played this game and you're a fan of any similar games such as Mario Kart, you should seriously give this a go, I can't recommend it enough. It's so good I even consider it to be the best Crash Bandicoot game ever made, and it's not even in the core series. Now, in some capacity I've covered all of the Crash games on PS1, apart from one. So join me next time where we're taking a look at a game that isn't aspiring to be Mario Kart, but Mario Party. That's right. I'm talking about Crash Bash. The more Wampa Fruit you collect, the faster your cart will go. If you collect and hold 10 Wampa Fruit, you'll be... Get out! Thanks for watching my review, hopefully you enjoyed it and if you did, give it a like, leave a comment below and maybe subscribe too. Let me know what your favourite kart racing game is and how you think Crash Team Racing compares to the Mario Kart series, I'd be interested to know your thoughts. Until next time, bye!